Ayan, kare ko. Okay, magandang hapon everyone. I'll just spotlight our So, welcome to Kwentuhan at Kultura Series 1. So, for the for the month of November, we'll be talking about Philippine myth and superstition. So, to those who are not enrolled in Filipino 101, welcome to our class. It's nice having you here. We're still hoping for others to join us in a while. So this is actually one of the many lectures that we will be having in the university starting November. So expect that in the next months, we will still be having other lectures focusing on the promotion of the Filipino culture and language. So um, thank you very much for your attendance. And I'm hoping that this will be a worthwhile lecture for all of you. So if you have questions later on, we will have an open forum session where you can ask your questions to our speakers. So before we proceed, allow me to introduce first our speakers. We actually have three speakers for this afternoon. First one, we have talk about Philippine mythology in Luzon. We have a faculty member of Mariano Marcos State University in Ilocos and a Fulbright language teaching assistant scholar at Skyline College in San Bruno, California. Let's welcome Professor Ryan Domingo. Hey, Ryan. And to talk about uh, Visayan mythology and superstition, I have here a colleague. She's actually one of the faculty members of the University of Mindanao, where I also come from, and that's in Davao City, Philippines. And currently, an FLTA, Fulbright FLTA scholar at Michigan State University, we have Professor Candice Yeses. Candice. And finally, I'll be talking about the Mindanao culture. So, welcome to myself as well. And to begin with this lecture, let us all have um, Professor Ryan Roy Domingo to talk about. Um, the Philippine mythology, specifically in the Luzon Island. So, Ryan? All right. Can you hear me? Uh, please give me a thumbs up if you can. All right. Thank you. So, magandang hapon. My name is Ryan. I'm uh, from Ilocos, Philippines, and I'm the 16th Fulbright FLTA Scholar of Skyline College here in San Bruno, California. So I work with the Kababayan Learning Community here in my home institution. So please give me a second to share my screen. All right. So for my part in today's presentation, I will share with you tidbits of Philippine mythology and um, superstitious beliefs particularly from my island, Luzon. All right. So the Philippines is an archipelago with 7,000 islands grouped into three. We have Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. Luzon is the largest, which comprises more than 50% of the population of the country. And there you can find eight regions, including the national capital region, where you can find the city of Manila, with 38 provinces and 74 cities all in all. So just imagine growing up in these places, listening to stories of fantasy and horror, which are believed to have happened in the country's historic past that up to the present are believed to have an effect on the Filipino people's way of life. But why are we rich in mythology and superstitions? I have two simple answers for this question. 
First is that our pre-colonial ancestors had their own way of life and believed to have worshipped gods and goddesses during their time. And second is that our culture had been influenced in a number of ways by foreign colonizers. So in the interest of time, I have chosen a few examples of mythical creatures that are popular in Luzon and the superstitions that come with these mythical creatures. First, of course, is Batala. Luzon, uh, Luzon's uh, mythology won't be complete without talking about this benevolent god uh, called Batala. He is a loving and benevolent god, a trait that existed before the arrival of Spanish missionaries. His love for mankind was said to be so great that at times he spoils them. Despite this immense love for mankind, sorry, my light, so there you go. Despite his immense love for mankind and his many other creations, he is not afraid to also punish or make others feel his almighty wrath. He's capable of easily conjuring disasters, be it famines or floods, to, to punish mankind for any possible transgression. So one of Bathala's creations are the Diwatas. And Diwatas are mostly found in the mountains and forests. So they are deities or nature spirits seen as guardians of nature. They look like regular humans, though their skin color can be either blue or red. Um, one of the diwatas that are associated with Philippine mountains is Mariang Sinukuan, which is believed to be the protector of Mount Arayat in Pampanga. So she watches over the needs of the people in the nearby town and used to regularly leave fruits and animals at the doorstep of locals who needed food during hard times. However, people became greedy, which angered her. So she stopped leaving food at their doorsteps. She made the fruit trees and animals in the mountain disappear. And she also never allowed the villagers to see her again. So there's one superstition that is associated with the story of Mariang Makiling. So every so often, men would disappear into the forests of the mountain. It is said that Mariang Makiling has fallen in love with those men and has taken them to her house to be her husband, to spend their days in matrimonial bliss. And then the next mythical creature is Capre. As you can see in the picture, Capre is a grimy tall, dark giant that smokes huge rolls of cigar or tobacco. He hides and lives atop large trees, particularly on big old mango, acacia, or balete tree, which are endemic to the Philippines. And it is the equivalent of Bigfoot. Capres do not have humans or do not harm humans, but are friendly and they, they love to fool around. They may contact people to offer friendship or they may contact people if they're attracted to a woman. Capres like to scare away or play pranks on vacationers or travelers and children playing at night. So there's this superstition that if you find yourself stuck in a place, particularly in the woods, or going around in circles, you might have been played or tricked by a capre. So when this happens, what you can do is to remove your top and wear it inside out, and you will find your way back. The third one is Tikbalang, which can be found in certain provinces, particularly in Rizal province. So this Tikbalang, takes the body of a man with the head of a horse. It is able to transform fully into human or turn invisible when humans are near. Tikbalangs are usually found in dark places surrounded by nature, like a dark forest or abandoned bridges. It is believed that whenever the tikbalang goes, plants and nature go along with it, growing in its step. By one account, tikbalang has a mane of sharp spines. Usually, bees are like three uh, thick gold spines. A person who obtains one of these spines can use them as a talisman in order to keep the tikbalang as his servant. The tikbalang must first be subdued, however, by leaping onto it and trying it with a specially prepared cord. The would-be tamer must then hang on while the creature flies through the air 
fighting madly to dislodge its unwelcome rider until it is exhausted and acknowledges its defeat. So there's also this superstition that goes along with the common saying uh, that rain from a clear sky means may kinakasal na tikbalang, which translates to a tikbalang is getting married. So when there's the rain and there's a clear sky, a tikbalang is probably getting married. This was potentially connected with a similar Spanish proverb that claimed that a witch was getting married when there was rain on a sunny day. And then we also have Nuno Sapunso. It's, it's like a dwarf, but specifically it's a small and big bearded being who gets angry very often and hurts those who dare to disturb his anthill. So they live in an anthill. So if an invader kicks his home, their foot will become swollen. For the bravest ones, if they dare to piss on it, their genitals will expand. And if that weren't enough, the Nuno can curse any trespasser by spitting at them, and the part that's affected will get inflated. There's also this superstition associated with the Nuno Sapunso. So in order to prevent any of the mentioned situations, if you don't want your genitals to shrink and grow, Children shouldn't play out between midday and three in the afternoon and get home before six. They need to avoid noisy places where Nunos live. And a more effective way to warn a Nuno um, is that saying tabi tabi po, which means please be on the side or please move aside. Again, say tabi tabi po. And then another one is that this Nuno Sapunso is believed to be. Uh, the reason behind particular illnesses not being able to be cured by modern um, medicine. So in this case, it is believed that the ailment may be due to Anuno's curse. So the victim is usually brought to an albulario, which is a Philippine practitioner of traditional medicine. Ah, sorry. And then, I also come from a place called Ilocos. So we have uh, lakes and rivers in my place. So we have this um, mythical creature called Perberoca. It can be found in Ilocos, Abra, and Apayao. So it's a giant amphibious creature with, uh, that is so huge that it can swallow all the water in a lake. It does this to lure people to go into the dried up lake and pick up the fish struggling there. So once they do this, the berberoca releases the water from its mouth, thereby drowning the people. The berberoca's victims are usually fishermen. It is revealed that despite its terrifying reputation, now look at this, the berberoca possesses a very unusual phobia of crabs. All right. And then we also have the batibat. It's also from my, my province. So it's a vengeful spirit blamed as the cause of the fatal nocturnal disease, sudden unexplained nocturnal death syndrome. It takes the form of a huge, as you can see in the photo, it takes a form of a huge old fat woman who resides in trees. When these trees are cut down to make posts for a house, the homeowner may find, that, may find out that they have inherited an unwanted guest. So the batibat migrates into holes found in the posts and gets particularly cranky when someone dares to sleep near it. The batibat will transform and sit on the chest of its victim until he suffocates. So it is the Ilocano's um, version of a nightmare. Now, there are also other popular superstitions that aren't necessarily related to mythical creatures, but are stand alone. So I have here five common or popular superstitions believed to be true in the Philippines, particularly in the zone. So we have sukob. So sukob means that it is bad luck for two sisters to get married in the same calendar year. So this requires like scheduling your marriage a year after your sibling's uh, marriage because you cannot get married in the same year. We also have oro plata mata, which means gold, silver, death. So for engineering or engineers rather, the number of steps of staircases at home should not be divisible by three. Otherwise, your house would be 
unlucky. So if you design your staircases, make sure that the number of stairs, I mean, the number of steps should be not divisible by three. And then we have three more. We have pagpag, which means shaking off the dirt. So it is believed that you should not go straight home after attending a wake. Otherwise, the spirit will follow you home. We also have this belief in usog, which is like, you should be careful when expressing fondness over children. Because when a person with strong energy greets a child, the child may soon after suffer from an from an unexplainable discomfort. And lastly, this is very popular in the Philippines. When you accidentally drop a fork or a spoon, it may mean someone, a visitor, will be coming over. So if it's a spoon, it's a male person. But if it's a fork, a female will come by to visit you over. So as you can see, even to these days, even to these days, uh, when technology has affected our societies and uh, uh, cultural communities, both negatively and positively, our mythology and superstitions were preserved. So we have to keep telling these stories to the next generation, for it is part of who we are. It is part of us being Filipinos. Thank you very much. In my native language, it's agyamanak, and in Filipino or Tagalog, it's salamat. So those are for my part. I don't know if we have time for the open forum. Uh, Sir Michael? Uh, Sir Ryan, can we have uh, Mom Candice first before we proceed to the open forum? Would that be okay? All right. Thank you very much, Sir Ryan. Let's give Sir Ryan a round of applause, please. Salamat. Well, at least now you already know if you drop a spoon or a fork, you're expecting a visitor. That's part of Filipino superstition. Thank you so much, Sir Ryan. And this portion, let's all welcome Professor Candice Lee Assess from Michigan State University. All right, uh, just give me a moment to get my slides working right. It seems to be going wonky. So as you have um, heard, the first set was from Luzon. So that's from the Luzon um, area. And uh, there are some superstitious beliefs which are observed across the country. So one superstitious be belief that maybe observing Luzon may also be observed either in Visayas or in Mindanao or even both. So that's common in Filipino culture. Yes. So I am, I think, let me see. Do you guys see my slides? Yes, Ron Candice. Okay, wonderful. So um, Sir Ryan covered a lot of really important aspects of um, Philippine um, literature. So the Visayas area is um, right in the center of uh, Luzon and Mindanao. So it's a very um, diverse place and people are often separated by the hundreds of islands that exist in that part. So um, my part of the discussion, in my part of the discussion, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the history and nature of the Visayan archipelago. Um, a couple of gods and goddesses, there are a lot of them, but I just chose a couple, um, in, the in the Visayan pantheon of the gods and um, the enduring myth of the Aswang. So after that, I'm going to talk about the island of Samar and its um, traumatic history, and then connect that to the mythical city of Biringan, which will be the, the main gist of my topic today, as well as some superstitions related to it. So when the Spaniards first came um, to the Philippines, uh, and when they landed on the Visayan Islands, they noticed that people were tattooed from head to toe. It was a common practice. So they called the place Islas de los Pintados, or basically the islands of the painted ones. But not all the science are tattooed. And the, more, the practice was really just more commonly done in the island of Cebu compared to other islands of, of the Visayas. So a very uh, good account of pre-colonial Philippines, its traditions and its people can be found in um, 
the Boxer Codex. So it's a 16th century, beautiful, beautiful manuscript with almost 100 illustrations of native Filipinos and royalty from all of the, over the country, as well as foreigners like Japanese Ronin, Chinese noblemen who were present in the country. So in that, in the Boxer Codex, they also included supernatural creatures, not just from the Philippines, but all around Asia. Um, now, uh, the Boxer Codex is found in the Lilly Library of Indiana University. And a lot of, a lot of what we know about the pre-colonial practices of the Filipinos are actually from the Boxer Codex. So, like I said, um, the Visayan Islands is very diverse in terms of history, culture, and tradition. And it's most well known for having been the first place where the Portuguese um, explorer Ferdinand Magellan, the same guy who led the first circumnavigation of the earth, set foot on. Specifically, he set foot on Homonhon, Eastern Samar, which is, you know, mostly the focus of our topic today. Um, the Visayas region is divided into three regions. So that's Western Visayas, Central Visayas and Eastern Visayas. You might have heard of the islands of Cebu, Bohol, um, Negros, because these are pretty popular islands. They're very popular tourist destinations. They're very, um, many of these places are very developed and they have a really strong tourism industries. But despite that, that sort of economic growth did not really reflect in all of the islands. And to be specific, 36 out of 100 individuals in Eastern Visayas are poor. Now, um, because the Visayas area is so diverse, it has an incredibly vibrant mythology and folk literature. Uh, one of my favorite creation myths ever is um, the, the creation myth of Alumsina and Tungkung Langit, which comes from the island of Panay in the Visayas area. So I'm not going to tell you the whole story, but the gist is that Tungkung Langit is known as the pillar of the skies. He's kind of like Batala, um, um, which was the, the Luzon kind of supreme deity. So he's the highest, highest ranking deity in, in the in that mythology. And his wife is this goddess called Aluncina. Now, she is a little bit sketchier than Tungkung Langit. She's considered the goddess of the Eastern skies, but um, there are also accounts in Philippine mythology which conflict with that because they consider her sometimes as a foreign goddess, not native to the Philippines. So their creation myth is one of the most beloved myths of the Visayas, and it explains how the earth and the universe was, um, uh, how it came to be. And it's a story of love and heartbreak and jealousy and betrayal and sadness and longing. So if you're ever interested in that story or in creation myths from the Philippines, I highly suggest um, this one, Anuncina and Tungkung Langit. Another really important um, goddess in the Visayan pantheon is Magwayen. So she is considered uh, to be the primordial goddess of the sea and in the underworld. So she's often um, described as um, a, a lady goddess with um, a tikbalang, if you're in a half horse, half human, reverse centaur, basically, uh, who would accompany her while she ferries the souls of the dead to the underworld. So Magwayen, along with Kap Tan, who is the, the god of the sky in the Visayan mythology, created the first world and the first humans. So again, there are many other gods, hundreds of them, I think, um, and each story is just as amazing as the next. But one of the most famous, if I would say, if, if not the most famous supernatural creature to hail from the Philippines is the supernatural creature called Aswang. So there are many versions of this, uh, of the Aswang, and you can hear them a lot in, um, in Luzon, in Mindanao, um, in Mindanao, which um, I live in, um, some versions of the Aswang would be the Sigbin, the Wakwak, and the Tiktik. Uh, they're common variations of the Aswang. So the myth of the Aswang actually originated from the Visayan Islands, specifically in the islands of Capiz and Antique. So when the Spaniards came, uh, one of the the first missionaries to come with them was Friar Juan de Placencia um, in the 15th century who wrote extensively about the Tagalogs. He claimed that the myth of the Aswang was very unique to the Visayans. But of course, as more people sort of got to connect with each other, 
these stories were um, um, kind of uh, these stories spread from region to region until um, it's now more widespread in the rest of the countries. So Aswangs are basically flesh-eating vampire shapeshifters who are originally people or witches who could transform into animals or monsters at nighttime. I live in the middle of the city, but I remember when I was a kid, there were stories in my neighborhood about this old lady, and then my brother was saying, oh, she's in Aswang, that's why we should throw rocks at her um, roof, which is bad, but... Um, <laughs> Yeah, um, it, it, it was happening right in the middle of the city. So, you know, kids could be cruel sometimes, but she wasn't actually an Aswang, <laughs> but she was just like an, a real, a, a lonely old woman who made friends with my mom, actually. So of the Aswang was also used by the CIA uh, during the Philippine-American conflict to scare Philippine rebels into submission. They would put out mangled, punctured bodies of dead rebels um, out in the open for people to see. And then from there, they let rumor spread that oh there's an aswang in this area in that area they killed these rebels so we should not rebel against the americans so basically that was you know what they were thinking of it's psyops basically okay so now we're going to zero in in the island of samar so as you can see it's this big island over here all right so um samar has a very traumatic history um, there was a battle that occurred during the Philippine-American War between Philippine forces and American troops, and it's called the Balanginga Massacre, Balaging, Balanginga Massacre. So where uh, General Jacob Smith, furious after having 48 of his members, uh, 48 members of his party ambushed by Philippine um, forces said, um, I want no prisoners. I wish you to kill and burn. The more you kill and burn, the better it will please me. The interior of summer must be made into a, a howling winter, uh, wilderness. So accounts say that 2,000 to 200,000 to 2,000 to 2,500 people died during this massacre. Others claim that the death toll could have been as high as 50,000, but the, his general order was that you should kill um, his, his order was basically to kill anyone who's older than 10. So that included women, um, teenagers, and of course men. But the troubles of Samar did not end with that. Typhoons often pass through Samar and one of the worst hit areas during Typhoon Yolanda, also known as Typhoon Haiyan, Tropical Storm Haiyan, uh, which killed three 6,300 people and left thousands more missing. Um, was was summer so a lot of them um took a very long time to rebuild after that typhoon and they, they keep getting typhoons like literally um almost every every few months and they have to keep rebuilding from that so um in, in a sense that's one of the, the the biggest reasons why a lot of them remain poor now Let's talk about Birian. It's in stark contrast with all of the things that we're hearing about Samar. So this is a short quote that I took from a feature story about Birian from uh, the news site, uh, Rappler.com. It said, I have been there. So one of the, they were interviewing like this um, fisherman and he, he was saying, I have been there many times. There's an area there adjacent to the tall trees where residents remind boat passengers to be in total silence because it is the portal leading to the Biringan area. So what is the Biringan city, right? So it's basically this, it's, it's rumored to be this um, metropolitan city that could rival the mega cities of Hong Kong and New York. There are lots of tall buildings and um, amazing technology. Think of it as Wakanda, but in the Philippines, but without T'Challa. So Biringan um, actually comes from the word where lots can be found in Warai. So it's rumor, of course, they're like, you know, there's no consensus to it, but the general um, belief is that it exists somewhere in between the municipalities of Gandara, Tarangan, and Pagsamhan in Samar. It's a fairly modern urban legend dating to the 60s. And um, it's a city that you cannot just go to, of course, you know, it's mythical. It's a mythical city that can be accessed only by invite, by the Encantos, the Dewatas, the, the fairy creatures who live there, by abduction, or most commonly by getting lost in the woods. So um, there were 
reports <laughs> of undelivered mail and cargo from people who have long been deceased. Um, for example, uh, they would get mail addressed to Biringan, but you know, of course, the mailman can't really deliver it because uh, the city doesn't exist. There was also a rumor of um, how apparently a group of construction um, deliverers bought a bunch of like construction materials um, looking for Biringan. Apparently somebody had ordered these materials, but then when they got there, they couldn't find the city. And when they sort of checked who ordered those, um, who ordered, you know, the construction materials, they saw that, oh, this person has been dead for a long time. But again, rumors. And one of the most famous rumors are stories about uh, about Biringan is uh, involves a, a lady named Carolina. So Carolina was a girl from Manila who summered with her friend to Samar. So she went there and apparently she got lost and people were looking for her for quite some time. And then suddenly after uh, months of her missing, her parents get a letter from her and the, the letter was addressed from a city called Biringan. And she was saying, uh, mom, dad, I'm here in Biringan city. I really like it here. I'm not going home. So <laughs> and that's one. So citizens of the mythical city are said to be people who do not have any philtrum. So this idea of not having philtrum is actually really pervasive in, in Philippine mythology. If you guys are from the Tagalog area, you might have noticed that um, before people enter the house, they would say taupo, which literally translates to I am human respectfully. So, you know, when you go to someone's house, you introduce yourself as a human person because um, diwatas or encantos and supernaturals would often disguise themselves as you, but they can't speak. So um, sort of to counter that, you know, to let them know that it's really you, you have to say taupo. And these people who are shapeshifters, they do not have Filtrum. There's also a similar city, uh, a similar legend of a city called Banwanaon, and um, it's roughly the same story, but the difference is that um, the, its inhabitants are like these elf-like creatures, you know, sort of like in the Lord of the Rings. So what could be causing, what could have caused people to believe in, in, in such a fantastic city, right? So one reason could be animism. People, Filipinos believe that things in nature have a spiritual essence. So for example, you can't just cut down old trees because spirits live there. Or if you do hurt or disturb them, they will take revenge on you. That's why while when you're passing through woods or a thicket of trees, or even a mound, like a termite mound, you have to go and say, Tabi tabi po, you know, sort of to let them know that you are passing by respectfully. So another reason could be this collective desire and fear at the same time of urbanization. So as what we could see, as what we've established earlier, summer is a, it's it's not an easy place to live in. It's a very poor place. My sis, my half sister, used to live in Samar, and um, their life there was very hard. Um, a lot of people survive by fishing, and again, it's not a very stable source of income. So. Um, it could be um, a representative of the region's collective desire to modernize without losing the untainted beauty of Samar. And it's also it could also be a warning for people uh, not to disturb nature as is. Another reason or another explanation could simply be it could have just been a wrong address. Uh, there's a city called Borongan also in Samar and people are saying maybe the letters were supposed to go to Borongan, the construction materials were supposed to go to Borongan, but it just got misspelled, um, so on and so forth. And a possible explanation as well, because the locals were saying that they would see lights in the woodlands in the middle of the night and they would, um, and, and from there they would they would claim that that is Biringan city. It could simply have been a light pillar phenomenon, which um, which have which have been cited in the Philippines multiple times. Okay, so now to the superstitions. <laughs> so, um, firstly, you know, what would you do? Um, what or what should you do as to not disturb these spirits? So. 
when that happens, the first and the most important thing that you do is you be quiet when crossing rivers and woodlands. Do not joke around. Do not um, mess around with your friends. Do not dare them to do stupid things when you're in the forest. And never speak ill of the supernatural. I remember my mom would usually say, um, she would, you know, my mom is a pretty, um, she's a believer in these kinds of things and she would tell me that or when she says there's a supernatural creature she would never go and say bad things about them oftentimes she would call them mabait and if you know that word it means good she was saying ah may mabait na naman or there's a good i don't know creature here so do not say bad things about them because they will get hurt <laughs> and angry so also be careful when cutting down old trees because again spirits live there and ask for permission when entering forests when you go hiking in the philippines mountaineering most of the time you would have to go through a tribal chieftain and then they would ask you to um, sacrifice something usually a chicken for their gods to to let them give you safe <laughs> path through the mountain <laughs> and lastly if you do find yourself in the mythical city of Biringan, do not eat their food. And specifically, do not eat the black food that they will offer you, because then you would have to stay in Biringan forever. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much, everybody, for listening. Okay, thank you so much, Mom Candice. Okay, now let me proceed to my part of the lecture. So as mentioned, Mam Candice and I are both from Mindanao. Okay, that's one of the three islands of the three major islands of the Philippines. Okay, um, one thing that is very fascinating about Mindanao mythology and superstition is that it's very group specific, which means that every tribe has its own unique set of um, mythology. Okay, unlike in other regions, usually it's general or it's common, but in Mindanao island it's usually culture specific which means that a certain tribe has its own uh, mythology so just so you know Mindanao is composed of six regions so we have regions uh, first one is region nine which is called the Zamboanga Peninsula so this is where the Chabacano as a language is spoken so this is also Spanish-based Creole and you also have region 10 northern Mindanao region 11 this is our place or region Region 12, Soxargen and Barm, or the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao. So Mindanao is basically a tri-people community. So when you say tri-people community, it means that there are three different groups. First one, you have the Catholics, we have the indigenous, and then we have the Moros or the Muslims. So basically, the island is an amalgamation of many cultures. That's why it's also very rich in terms of um, literature, mythology, um, culture. So when traveling through the Philippines, living and interacting with the locals, one will undoubtedly experience the beliefs and written rules, virtues, values, and needs of the country. And to tell you honestly, this is heavily influenced by different um, eras of colonization in the country. So we had Spanish, um, Japanese, and also the American civilizations, plus the practice of paganism. So when people, the, 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 the traditional groups would worship like idols or trees in forests or rocks. That's actually where they drew their inspiration for the different mythology or mythical creatures that they have. For example, in rem remote rural places like Mindanao, people still believe in the existence of supernatural beings. And if you have heard a while ago, it was mentioned that there are swamps in the Philippines. Well, from the place where I come from, it's like we have, this is just a rumor, but our community believes that there are three houses there that have a swamps. The entire families are all swamps. So it's a belief, but it actually affects the relationship of the community towards these families. So usually they would avoid these families just so for them not to be victimized by these families. Okay. And we also heavily believe on the philosophy that there are always evil spirits or supernatural powers guarding or yeah, guarding uh, different, um, for example, rivers, seas, skies, and mountains. So they are usually the ones making sure that they are not being abused by the humans. So let's talk about Mindanao mythology. So as mentioned, this is very group specific. And so let me introduce you to Mibuyan, the mother of the underworld, which is 
for the Bagobo. The Bagobo is also one of the many tribes that we have in Mindanao. So there is a special place in the Bagobo underworld for children who died at their mother's breasts, for those babies who died. So it's actually Mibuyan who adopts these dead babies, this, their souls, and then uh, feeds all of them. And then once these babies are already full, then they are also going around, trooping to another district underground to join people who died later in life of disease or any form of sickness. For example, the other souls, the elderly. So these babies also join them. So Mibuyan is like the caretaker of all the dead babies in uh, for the Bagobo group. Aside from Mibuyan, there's also Tigbanwa, the terrible ogre. Okay, this is also part of Bagobo mythology. Okay, Bagobo meets this guy that Tigban was having one eye with tall, lean bodies and long necks that they can twist to see what's behind them. Their hair is disheveled and their one eye is either red or yellow. They have flat noses and pointed teeth. So as you can see here on the picture, it's actually very horrible if you look at it, this one. Now, these creatures are afraid of dogs. So if you want to avoid Tigban Noa, well, definitely you'll have to have a pet dog in your house. Just Well, in that case, if you are from the Bagobo group. Okay, or at least you'll have to have um, a pet dog. Next one is that Tambanokano, or also called as Tambanakawa, or it's also called the giant crab for the Mandaya group. So this is another tribe in the Mindanao Island. While Bakunawa may be the most popular moon-eating giant in the Philippine mythology, he is certainly not the only one. So in the areas of Mindanao, there's Minokawa, a giant bird-like uh, being. Um, also from Mindanao, bird in an old Mandaya folk tale recorded in 1916. So this um, researcher here, here named Mabel Kukol was one of the many anthropologists who did extensive research in the field of Mindanao mythology. So there's actually a research that consolidates all of the pieces of literature that we have in Mindanao. And that's actually archived in one of the big universities in the country. So Tambanokano is believed to be a colossal crab brought into the world through the union of the sun and moon. And according to legend, Tambanokano ate its parents, the sun and the moon. That's why most, um, in most times before, Mandaya would experience darkness okay, or short um, period of um, daylight. And then you also have Kurita, the many-limbed monster. And this one is specific for the Moro group or the Muslims. Well, majority Muslims do not actually believe in superstitions. They have their own cultural practices that are heavily anchored in their religion. But there are certain Moro groups in the island that have believed in different mythical creatures as well. So Kurita, a terrible creature with many limbs, lived partly on land and partly in the sea, but its favorite haunt was the mountain where the Ratan grew. So if you want to avoid Kurita, Moros believe that you need to avoid the Ratan tree. And then we also have Tarabusao, the flesh eater. And this one's also from the Moro group. It's an ugly creature in the form of a man lived on Mount Matutun. So Mount Matutun is now called Mount Matutun, and this is located in the South Cotabato region. And far and wide from that place, he devoured the people laying waste the land. That's why um, hikers would usually avoid Mount Matutun because they believe that this Tarabusao still exists in that area. And then we also have the bird of Mount Gurain, the seven-headed bird, also from the Moro group. It is a dreadful bird having seven heads and the power to see in all directions at the same time. Mount Gorain was its home, and like the others, it wrought havoc in its region. So you would usually notice that some of the um, remarkable legends in Philippine literature have the presence of all these or some of these mythical creatures. So usually if it's a moral literature, then it also incorporates these mythical creatures into the stories or into the storyline. And then we also have, aside from those mythical creatures, I'd like to briefly talk about the different superstitions and I think these are superstitions that have not been mentioned by either Sir Ryan or Man Candice. And like to talk about first about belief in the tonongs. Now, as mentioned a while ago by Man Candice, it's really important to be very careful when you go to forests, but not only forests, but also any body of water in the Philippines. So when you, for example, when you go to rivers, enjoy its cold water, or when you go to lakes, you have to be very careful as it may be inhabited by different supernatural creatures or supernatural beings. In the Lanao area, which is one of the places in Mindanao, as in all other areas of the Philippines, many beliefs and practices considered superstitious are still very popular. Now, one of these is the belief in tonongs, or supernatural spirits that live in lakes and other places. Legend tells of tonong named Mipato. So there are actually a lot of tonongs. There are tonongs that guard rivers. There are also tonongs that guard 
um, other bodies of water. So they vary also in terms of feature or physical characteristics. Now, one of the tonongs identified according to many of the archived literature that we have is Mipato. He looks like a big carabao or water buffalo with golden horns. Anyone who tries to catch him will drown in the lake. And legend tells a certain story in which during the Spanish colonization, there was a group of Spanish soldiers who tried to cross a river, but then they were stopped by this tono, or also called as Mipato. And because Mipato was shot by these um, Spanish soldiers, what Mipato did was he rose the water level of the river, which caused in the drowning of the entire Spanish battalion. And then we also have, I don't know if you have seen this one here in the United States or in other areas, but we have the Balete tree. Balete is actually one of the most hunted trees ever in the Philippines. Now, when you go to any rainforest, Filipinos believe that you have to avoid big trees with black trunks or dark skin trunks. Why? Because Filipinos believe that it is a home for many supernatural powers or supernatural creatures. Aside from a home, it could also serve as a portal that will allow supernatural powers roaming around the human world to cross the their dimension or another dimension. Now, Balete tree is believed to be inhabited by spirits who prey on people. So you have to definitely avoid this one when you go to the Philippines. This, is, this may be like a folklore or a legendary belief, but I'm telling you, um, you know, sometimes it's also safe to believe in these superstitions because it may, of course, you know, bring you to safety. And I'd like to be very realistic about this one. My mom told me a very real story. She had a cousin before, and that cousin went missing for almost a month. So it was a he. So he was not able to go home for about a month, and all of the relatives were actually very worried about this cousin. And surprisingly, that cousin returned, returned home after a month, and they asked where he was. And when that cousin started narrating, all he could remember was that he woke up one night under a balete tree. And that balete tree was actually existing at a nearby river, a, a river nearby our house, okay, our, my grandma's house. And sadly, after a month, that cousin, my mom's cousin also died. He committed suicide. And the relatives believe that his soul was actually taken by the supernatural powers and that the body that went back home was actually not anymore that cousin. So maybe there's another soul carry or inside that um, body of my cousin, of my mom's cousin. So that's actually a real story that was shared, but of course we didn't know. Previously, there was no history of depression, as you may know. Depression is at the modern times, but before, um, they usually believe in superstition. And so that was a belief or the reason why um, that cousin died. And then we also have, yeah, when it's full moon and the parade of spirits. So when you, for example, visit the Philippines and then you sleep for several nights in your grandma's house or in your relative's house, do not be surprised if dogs start howling. And Filipinos believe that if dogs start howling, dogs on the streets, that means that there's a parade of spirits. So dogs are one of the very few creatures in the Philippines that can only witness like in their naked eyes who could see the spirits, okay, the supernatural powers during the evenings. And yeah, I think this one's very significant, souls and butterflies. So in the Philippine culture, it's believed that any butterfly seen during someone's wake is actually like the soul of that dead person. And I don't know if you also have, or if your parents, or if your grandmothers or your grandparents believe in the same um, superstitious belief, but most Filipino families really believe because believe this one because during wakes, it's very common to see butterflies or big moths. And they usually say that, oh, it's the soul of my grandpa, it's the soul of my grandmom or the parent uh, that died. So this is actually the most common form of Filipinos associate their loved ones with, with, with um, is a butterfly. And upon observation around the time the loved one had just passed away, you're bound to notice a butterfly fluttering around as if expressing that your loved one is doing okay and that there's no need to be sad anymore. And I could really remember, it's still fresh in my mind, that during my grandpa's um, funeral, there was a white small butterfly. And whenever we see white, that small white butterfly, it may not be not necessarily that the same butterfly, but whenever we see that white butterfly, it always reminds us of our grandfather. So, yeah, that actually ends the presentation. 
Now, just to wrap things up, just for you to be reminded that Philippines is actually very rich, not only in terms of culture, but also in terms of mythology and superstition. You're not really required as Filipinos to really believe in these superstitions, but when you go to the Philippines, you also need to be very observant with the different practices that you know, the neighborhood observes because some of your actions or some of your words may be a taboo for a certain community or society. So you better be aware also of these different um, cultures, uh, different superstitions and mythical creatures, just so you to be you know, fully included in the society where you will be uh, spending your time with, okay? Now let's go to the questions. Mga katanungan? I'm sorry? Oh, is there, will there be a class here? Okay. Yeah, 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 yes, Lawson. Uh, I have a question from Professor Lee. He says, when like, was the, the massacre thing in like, Banding? I don't know how to say it. Yeah. But... Uh, Dawson um, is asking, when was the massacre, Candice? Oh, yeah. So the massacre occurred um, on the 28th of September, 1901. So that's just a few years um, after the Americans took over the Philippines uh, from, from the Spaniards. Yeah. So um, there are many sort of versions of the story. There's actually a really good movie that chronicles sort of the journey of this um, of this young boy, I think, who whose family was massacred during the Balanginga mass uh, during the Balanginga massacre, and it's a um, it's a movie called Balanginga, the Howling Winds, and I really remember this movie because there was a time. It's an indie movie basically, and um, it was like it was it it had um, international acclaim but we couldn't watch it in the philippines for some reason because there are no places there are no movie theaters who would show it so i remember me and my friends had to put up posters um to sort of petition the city into showing the movie and they did show the movie um and but only for like a couple of showings so yeah 1901 september 28 1901 yeah um, thank you very much, Candice. I'm really sorry, but I have to cut this very short. I think there are people waiting outside the classroom and they might be having our class here inside the classroom. Okay. So yeah, um, for my students, if you have any questions to our speakers, you can always address it to me and then I'll send it to our speakers. So once again, let's give Sir Ryan and Ma'am Candice a round of virtual applause, please. Thank you very much, Ma'am Candice and Sir Ryan. You take care. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.